You're listening to National Health Executive's Finger on the Pulse podcast with me, your host, Matt Roberts, to guide you beyond the headlines with news, views, and insider truths from across the healthcare sector. Welcome back to NHE's Finger on the Pulse podcast. Today's conversation is going to centre around an area of health that's been growing in prominence quite a bit recently, which is around shared decision making. We're hearing a lot in the news about empowering patients in their own care, offering more personalised sort of approaches and providing a better overall NHS experience. So I'm delighted to be joined in these conversations by a range of experts across the field. So we have Antonis Papasolomontis, I'm sorry if I say that slightly wrong, um, Director of External Affairs at AbbVie. We have Rachel Power, Chief Executive at the Patients Association. We have David Pilbury, who from Pennine uh, MSK Partnership, I believe you're Lead Physiotherapist and Clinical Specialist Physiotherapist. Uh, that's right, yeah. So I work in rheumatology, so I'm a, a practicing clinician. Amazing. And I suppose we'll, for the benefit of our audience who may not be fully aware of what each of you do, we'll give each of you a chance to sort of really explain what it is you do and a little bit about how that links into what we're talking about today. So I suppose we'll start first with you, Antonis. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. So yes, no, you, you, you pronounced my name perfectly well, so that was very good. Uh, I'm Antonis Papasolomontos, um, Director of External Affairs at Abbey. Uh, for those that don't know, Abbey is a uh, global biopharmaceutical company. So we're involved in um, the development, uh, research and development of, of innovative medicines, uh, which we hope will uh, improve healthcare and patient outcomes. Uh, we operate in a, a range of different areas, so things like rheumatology, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, gastroenterology and dermatology. Uh, we also engage in uh, areas like Parkinson's, chronic migraine, uh, cancers such as chronic lymphocytic le- leukemia. So quite a broad um, portfolio, quite a broad area of healthcare that we uh, seek to make a difference in. And I guess to answer your question about how we tie into shared decision making, um, you know, we're really committed to working with um, the healthcare system, with healthcare teams, uh, clinicians, with patient organisations and patients to um, ensure that the aim of in, uh, ensuring patients are involved in the decisions that they make about their care um, are front and centre of the of the NHS and the care that they receive. So we're really committed and passionate about how uh, individuals are informed about their service and treatment choices uh, and how we can support them in um, getting a decision around their care that they're comfortable with and that they feel they have ownership of. Amazing. And sort of jumping into those patient sort of focused organisations, obviously, Rachel, um, as Chief Executive of the Patients Association, um, I don't know if you want to go next and explain a little bit about your role and how that fits in. Great. Yeah, delighted to. Um, Thanks very much for the invitation to join us. So the Patient Association is... um, a UK national charity and our, our very mission is about giving effect, effect to the patient's voice uh, to improve patient experience and to support people to engage fully in their own care, which is probably why I'm, why I'm here, because we're very passionate about shared and supportive um, decision making. So we've been around for about 60 years supporting patients um, through the core values that we work with, which is about collaboration, inclusiveness and empowerment. Um, we're non-disease, non-condition specific. And the one of the other differences about us is that we have patients as our members. We are a membership organisation. So in the last year, we had contact with over 8,000 patients through a range of different work through our helpline, which is available 9.30 to 5 every day to, for patients to help them to signpost in a, and offer advice on accessing services. But also we um, have a range of information, including shared decision making on our website. But we also listen to the views of patients every day through running focus groups, surveys, um, individual interviews so that we can work very closely with NHS E&I and try and ensure that the patient's voice is heard. Brilliant. And I suppose that fits in also um especially the sort of working closely with the nhs with um david obviously for the last one we're coming to but by no means the least you're offering sort of a clinician's view here into it aren't you so i don't know if you want to explain as well yeah so i i've got a couple of roles really i'm a, a practicing clinician so the majority of my week is spent with patients and i work in rheumatology predominantly although i cover glossolalgia services as well um, I've got a role with versus arthritis uh, as one of the MSK champions, and one of my projects was around involving patients in in planning of services. And uh, I've got an associate role with 
ACWA, which is a, a quality improvement organisation in the northwest of England that works with NHS organisations. And I work in the personalised care and person-centred care programme. So talking on shared decision making and um, our trust uh, and our organisation were involved in a lot of the early trials of option grids and shared decision making. We realised that um, our main mission statement with our patients was to have the patient at the centre and involved in care of, along every step um, and establishing that culture in our practice every day um, was really encouraging and really helped us progress our service really quickly um, it's far easier in some fields than others but we used some of the learning that we got from uh, the areas of the option grid research and sort of transpose that onto other areas of our practice and by going out with aqua to other organizations across the northwest it means i can go out and pick up tips and ideas and find areas that are working really well and bring them back to our organization as well so there's a there's a, a good advantage to that the other the last part of my role was um the nhs went out uh, to tender a little while ago on commissioning decision support tools um across a range of common conditions uh, health conditions so i was part of the versus arthritis team that designed uh, some new tools on knee pain, hip pain, back pain, and shoulder pain, which are due for publishing. Uh, that I believe it just got nice approval in the past couple of days, and will come out in the early part of next year. And we used patients very heavily in the development of those tools because it was really important that we weren't addressing our concerns, but we're addressing the patient's concerns first and foremost. Yeah, and I suppose as you probably see with you saying your role is. Uh so frequently um, involved with patients, that is a large part of what shared decision making is, isn't it? It's ensuring that by giving this opportunity for the patient to have input in their care, that we're addressing their real concerns, not we, what we as clinicians, as healthcare sort of organisations and support to, uh, services think of problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, essentially appointment uh, very often for the patient, not for the clinician. There are only a handful of situations where we have to gather certain information. And if we go down the wrong route early on in the appointment, we can find we can waste an awful lot of time just trying to address things that we think the patient wants addressing and not actually what they want addressing. Yeah, and I suppose is that something that you see, Rachel, in a lot of the work that yourselves do um, that really tracks that um, patients want this opportunity opportunity sorry um to have that real say and be able to say what their concerns are from that very first stage absolutely um i think it's really important to all to say really not not one size fits all so but the majority of patients and our members we served that surveyed them uh, a few weeks ago to ask them this question and and they said yes absolutely we want to be involved and it's the very core of the way that we work um you know really picking up on some of the stuff that david did there talks there about leaflet development and information development but i think we do need to look at and and you know the, the davids of this world are really passionate around shared decision making but sometimes it can be really really hard for um, patients to be aware that they have the right to make the choice about their care and treatment and have those options explained in a meaningful way and to feel truly part of of that decision making process and as a patient association we're we're about to launch our new strategy uh, at the beginning of 2021 and and the strategy will be around true patient partnership and how we can how we can engage the systems and patients to work together to achieve that. Definitely. And I suppose um, on that same sort of strand of thought, um, Antonis, from the sort of AbbVie side and the sort of feeding in and being one of those support um, systems that helps the end product that we've heard there, um, how do you do you guys fit into sort of supporting the patients in that way? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think there's a number of different ways where Abby um, seeks to and absolutely has to engage with uh, the patient community and the uh, uh, patient group community as we're developing our um, 
uh, our innovations. So a couple of different examples where we would look to engage with individuals would be around the, uh, the areas of clinical development that we want to try and progress. So really having a deep understanding around where unmet need is, where unmet medical need is within the, uh, uh, from the patient perspective, from the individual perspective is really important to us so that we can try and develop uh, innovations or to make sure that we're targeting the areas that will add most, most value to people. Um, another area is, of course, once we, uh, as a pharmaceutical company, once we produce a, a, a treatment, it's also understanding that that can introduce a level of complexity to the healthcare system. Innovation is, is brilliant, but of course, it can come with questions as well. It can, it can increase the number of choices that are put in front of healthcare teams and put in front of patients. So it's important for us to make sure that we understand where the knowledge gaps are, how we can present the information in a way which is, is accessible in a way which is understandable um, so that it supports people to be able to have those discussions with their healthcare teams about the right service and the right treatment for them. So it's really, those are just two areas where it's really important for us that we collaborate with, with clinical teams like David's and, and patient groups like Rachel's to make sure that we are explaining what we're bringing forward and how, um, how we can have patients make more informed uh, decisions that they're comfortable with. Definitely. And would you say that's probably one of the biggest challenges you face is that obviously a lot of this is about giving more opportunities, but we don't want to overwhelm patients or clinicians or anyone involved in the process. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, uh, science is, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't, I don't pretend to understand a lot of the stuff that, that my brilliant colleagues are able to uh, develop and then bring to, the, uh, bring to patients. But the, the interesting thing is, as science is evolving so much and the types of innovations that we launch are, are evolving so much, it's really exciting in the sense that it can dramatically improve patient outcomes. Also, the, the, the medicines and innovations and other types of innovation like digital tech and uh, things like that, they have a, a unique ability to actually change the way in which a service is delivered as well. So not only uh, is the treatment different, but the way in which the individual accesses that treatment uh, might might change. It might mean that they don't engage with healthcare so frequently, those kind of things. So there's a knock-on effect of that innovation and, and there is an important role to play in ensuring that people understand what the, the different trade-offs are. Not all innovation is the same, not all of the options are the same. So working to clearly articulate and clearly make sure that the information is presented in a way which is accessible and that the information is uh, available for people to make that decision in consultation, of course, with their healthcare teams, uh, is really, really critical to ensure that the full the full benefits can be can be realised. Definitely, and I suppose um, we'll go to Rachel next from the patient association side. Is that something that um, tracks very much with what you see and with what you the conversation you have with your members? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think we need to. I think we need to. Uh, understand that you know if shared decision making is 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 really operational throughout the nhs it, there is going to be huge benefits to both the system from informed and engaged patients and patients want to be informed and engaged and one of the areas that i'm going to be looking at very early next year is is some of the great work that's been out there in the past around patient leadership and how we can train and to empower patients so you know the well-informed empowered patient is much more likely to be in control of their health um, and their decisions then based on their personal circumstances and I think that that preference based decision making can only help the system and clinicians within the system but of course we've we've been in a period this year where patient involvement it was never strong but it has become much weaker. Yeah and, and that's something I suppose that um, I'll ask uh, to you David as a clinician that is dealing on that front line very um, interesting sort of uh, shared decision making and patient uh, autonomy in these decisions. How has that been interacting in the current circumstances with COVID and with this real restriction? It's, it's had to be quite an efficient healthcare system. So how do we still work in those sort of steps? I suppose is it, it's been a really uncertain time and I think even more uncertain for patients than it ever has been because there's no absolute with anything that we're talking about. So it, I, from a rheumatology and MSK uh, field, like I would tackle usually, something like a joint injection becomes increasingly complex because we know that the steroid would impact on the immune system. 
but we don't know how much in the individual it will impact. So whereas the clinician will bring the diagnosis, the cause of the disease, prognosis and the treatment options and outcome probabilities, the patient brings that experience of illness and the, their individual social circumstances, their attitude to risk and their individual preferences and um, and the knowledge of what has happened to them in the past. And I think each discussion when it happens has to be very individual and tailored to that day, even that moment in time, because you can change your view overnight or over the following days, depending on what happens. And COVID itself has created this level of uncertainty within the healthcare professionals and within the patients of even knowing if it's secure and safe enough to come in for an appointment, never mind um, an intervention at the end of it. And we know that 50,000 joint replacements haven't been done as a result of COVID already. That is a significant backlog and an option of treatment that's been taken away from patients just at the drop of a hat. Um, second to that, the things that we would consider as steps before something as drastic as a joint replacement, they've also been impacted on COVID. So it, it, the discussion has to be as honest as it can be of relaying the fact that we know that there are risks involved in the treatment, but also conveying the fact that we don't know what those true risks are to an individual. Um, yeah. It makes I, it a real challenge. Yeah, no, I, I can certainly imagine. Um, and I suppose there, there was a really interesting stat I read, um, sort of kind of related to that recently, that I think it was 43% of working age adults in England didn't understand necessarily or didn't have a full grasp of the health information they were get, being given. And that rose even higher with numerical aspects. I suppose, um, Rachel, from the work that the Patient Association do, how do we make health information like that more accessible to patients so that they can feel they're in a position to take a role in this shared decision making to make these tough decisions? Yeah. So by involving patients, um, I, you know, we do a lot of work with different organisations and some of their patient information. And sometimes it is written so so much from the clinician point of view that you, you, you've lost somebody in the first paragraph of the work that you've done and and I think you'll all have seen this last this week um, Marmot reviewing on health inequalities and at the beginning of the pandemic um, we did a we did a pandemic patient experience report um, and one of the principles that came out of there was around communication because we need to think about how individuals listen and take in information and how it can be written um, in the most, the, the most, uh, the, the basic way, it needs to be in plain English. Um, so we do lots of work with patients and, and bring information to them to ask them to check it and then look at health literacy and health literacy standards to make sure that the information is clear. But I think it's also about the communication that people receive. And David's touched on that slightly. Um, and, and, you know, being able to patients to be able to understand and being able to feel empowered enough to ask about, you know, especially during pandemic periods and, and uh, you know, the benefits of doing something something now and the risks that are there and what are the alternatives and what is the benefit of doing nothing and we have done we've done quite a lot of work with patients over the last few months to try and ensure and the system when they're writing out to people around delayed electives and you know we had 67 percent of respondents in our survey had their health and care appointments cancelled and didn't know when they were going to hear again um, and the letters that they received felt very corporate was the words that we had fed back to us and didn't feel like it was really addressing their needs yeah absolutely and as you say like addressing their needs and having in sometimes in sort of layman's terms rather than um, clinicians sort of voices as difficult or as much as that might be an extra step can have a massive impact um, I suppose going to Antonis, to you, um, obviously a lot of what AbbVie do and a lot of the uh, information you put out is, again, very either scientific or it's very sort of clinically driven. But is that something you've come across as well um, or the organisation has of trying to make sure that all this information that comes out can be understood by everyone? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier on, that I'm not a, a scientist at all, so I get completely flummoxed by some of the stuff that's coming out because it's so interesting. It's incredibly complex at the same time, though. It's um, you know, picking up on a couple of points that, that both Rachel and, and David have, have said. I think COVID has shown us um, just how important it is to make sure that information is accessible and clearly understood. Um, I, I like what Rachel was just saying there. We can have a tendency sometimes to put it into a corporate speak, and that's uh, something that we need to avoid doing. We need to make sure that there is an ambiguity there. And COVID's highlighted that where there is ambiguity, uh, whether it means that people think they can't access the healthcare that they can or, or, or whatever it might be, can lead to some quite severe health outcomes. So I think uh, making sure that there is clarity of message, that there's not ambiguity and that the information that we're providing is being co-created as far as possible with individuals who are going to use it, e.g. patients, is, is critically important. Some of the work that we've done through this year with Rachel and others uh, is to try and understand about how do you make uh, health information more accessible? How do you make it more uh, available? And the discussions that we've had with the various different groups has definitely shown that um, it is uh, critical. It needs to be a part of understanding the health needs of populations, that there are good resources out there that uh, exist um, already and there's a, a need to better signpost. But I also think a couple of points I pick up is that, um, firstly, it's a, we can also do a better job of understanding where individual patients and where individuals are accessing their information. It's not always in the places that we would assume. So there's various different channels, I suppose, whether it's social media, uh, leaflets, uh, it's going to work for uh, different things are going to work for different people. And we need to we need to understand where people are accessing information to be ensuring that the uh, the information is in the right place. And also where in the NHS we might be able to add some some value. So, for example, um, one of the areas that I uh, that I have some experience in is in, in hepatitis C, for example. And we understood through engaging with patients and patient organizations and the healthcare teams that the pharmacist was going to play a very important part in uh, ensuring that information got to individuals who, who may be at risk uh, of contracting hepatitis C or who had it. So understanding the places in which people engaged uh, was really important in making sure that the information uh, was, was getting to them. So ultimately, all, all this was meant to ensure that, that patients could to get more information to be able to make that shared decision uh, that we want to see with their with their clinical teams. And then the final point I'd say is just in picking up what David said around um, patient choices can change day to day. It's also understanding that it's not a one-time thing. Shared decision making doesn't happen once at the beginning of a patient journey and then stop. It can it can vary all the time depending on where the individual is on their uh, treatment or uh, on their patient pathway, for example, to use that phrase. And it can change over 24 hours, as David said. So understanding how you ingrain it in uh, that culture of shared decision making in every interaction is really important as well. Definitely. And I suppose just sticking with Abvi um, briefly, um, you recently sort of produced a report um, that was based partly around sort of policy discussions you've been involved in, um, and that made many recommendations. And obviously, we've talked about the importance of all this information being able to be picked up by the patient, but being able to be picked up by sort of key decision makers who set out guidance and recommendation to be able to have shared decision making become part of the culture throughout everything we do. That's a huge um, aspect of this as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that um, uh, it's, it's really there's a lot of really good work going on, at, uh, I guess, a national uh, policymaker level around around shared decision making. Uh, I know that NICE, for example, have a consultation out uh, or is due to come out uh, and close in the new year around their shared decision making guideline. That would be a critical important um, milestone in this debate. Organisations like Rachel's have been involved in this for a long time. Uh, and the work that we've done is really our contribution to trying to understand what the key enablers and barriers are. From a, from a, I guess, a national policymaker perspective, I think it's well understood uh, that shared decision making needs to be uh, a fundamental principle of healthcare delivery. And to pick up a point that Rachel said, actually, it's it, it's not only good for the individual, although of course that is number one, but it's also good for the system. If you can engage uh, individuals in the delivery of their care, uh, and and bridge that gap uh, to make it more around personalized care so the individual is more brought in to the, the care plan that they have. 
it will ultimately be better for the efficiencies of the health system. Individuals will hopefully manage their condition better, whatever that might be, whether that entails adherence to treatment or whether that you know, is adherence to other elements of healthcare intervention. And that will ultimately, hopefully, enable the system to become more efficient in the way in which it manages its, uh, its pathways. And then the, I guess the final element I'd say from the work that we've been doing, one of the cr critical elements has been about how do you then embed that national approach, the national guidelines which might come out, the national pushes which, which might come out from very much from the top down. How do you embed it in all of the great work that happens from the bottom up? And that's probably where David can probably comment much more than I can. It's uh, how do you support the embedding of, of shared decision making in, in local uh, areas or in uh, particular therapy areas or, or condition areas um, in a way which is uh, practical and adoptable um, to make sure that it actually is then uh, comes through to the patient and the healthcare team. So you know, David's obviously managed to do it um, in, in his area and, and I'm sure we'll be able to add some value around how that actually gets embedded locally. Certainly. Um... Um, we'll jump to David in a second. I think, Rachel, um, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, well, and Thomas actually finished off really well there. My my um, my contribution was uh, that it the, the national and, and the national policy around shared decision making and everything else is moving forward. But what we did here during the pandemic and the early stages of the pandemic was that need for that local inter interpretation and that need to really understand your local community and that place based. So an example will be up, um, which was around the Leeds area, where at the time of the shielding, the messages were going out very much in English and social distancing and local GPs were re-recording in, in local dialects so that people could really understand what, what was meant by shielding and social distancing. And and, and that's a one off in, in the middle of a pandemic. But I think that the, the national can only be principles. And it's something we've been speaking to NHS e and I about is, is, you know, setting those principles, but then lo leaving local adaptation to how people need to communicate, because your letter is not always the way, your leaflet is not always the way. Sometimes, you know, there are languages out there that, that aren't that aren't written. You know, people people listen and hear and learn in different ways. And that's where that local interpretation and, and implementation is really important. Definitely. And I suppose um, that's probably something, David, you see as well quite a bit, um, being as heavily involved in sort of the, the care side that you are, that uh, you see that sort of approach. Yeah, Rachel Ray, raised some really important points there. Is that I, I've worked for 18 years in Greater Manchester and Oldham, and our cultural diversity is very similar to that of Leeds, I suppose, where 30% of our population, English, isn't necessarily the first language. And access to those resources, often you tend to find that what we produce creates a bigger divide between uh, those of cultural and ethnic minorities. And it disadvantages the people who are already disadvantaged. And I think the skill with the clinicians is all about having a range of tools in their arsenal where they can speak in a particular way, make it relatable, draw certain things pass certain information, signpost patients are really good resources. But the fact that the majority of our resources are, are written in English is a huge problem because essentially we're excluding parts of the population and making it more difficult for them to engage fully. Um, and it, that, that creates a bigger and bigger divide. And I think the, the level of expectation with patients you can sort of see us moving towards um, with the national guidelines. They're fantastic, but you have got to tailor it to your individual population because you will know what the individual needs are. Um, and it's how you support your team to do that. And we found we needed to bring in health literacy training when we brought in the shared decision-making work because trying to make things relatable in a variety of different ways is really important and then things like motivational interviewing and finding out what's an individual's drive um, and where they're at in terms of stages of change it significantly improves their engagement with healthcare um, and as such it, I suppose improves their compliance with treatment it 
if they're picking their treatment option, then they're far more likely to go along with it. And they, that's massively important when we're talking about some medications in particular that will have shortfalls. Not everything is a perfect treatment. There, there are certainly some trade-offs with everything. Uh, absolutely. And I suppose that probably puts me into a really nice point that I'm going to ask each of these individually, um, but we'll start with you, David. That what would be your sort of key top level piece of advice for those that are listening, just in order to help implement and support um, shared decision making and support patients to have this real ownership of their own care as well? I I thought about this long and hard last night when I was preparing for this, and I kind of thought you've, you've got to be brave enough to ask those that are affected by the service that you provide what our problems are and how and where we fall short because we won't necessarily know that without being told it because we could think we're doing a great job but the people that we serve actually are the people that will probably pick up our biggest deficiencies and I think willing a willingness to act on the suggestions that they give you because I think most healthcare professionals will worry about asking patients for their advice and support on the basis of not knowing whether they can act on the great suggestions because large organisations and large uh, it's, things like the NHS in general, is it, there's so many layers sometimes of bureaucracy that if you want to change something locally, you've got to empower your local services to do that. Um, and I think admit when you don't have all the answers is everybody is a human being at the end of the day. And I would like to my family members and myself to be treated very in, in very humanistic care of not everybody has all the answers all the time. And I think the fact that you can search for those answers in a variety of places, patients provide so many answers to things um, that we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it, it is such an important point. Um, I suppose, Rachel, next we'll go to you. Um, what would your top level sort of bit of advice be? Um, I think to be genuine and, and to truly believe in the benefits of shared decision making uh, and, and to remember that that person that you are, that patient, um it has a full has a life and a, and and I think it's asking that question of the patient of what matters to you what's important to you right now and I think by starting with that question you'll you'll get to what David really wants um because by asking that question you know it's about living life to the full we're all we we are patients we are patients but we are people living with conditions and and we know we know what we want and actually we want to work with our professionals and I just think starting the conversation with what matters to you yeah no I think that's such a, an important part of it um, that we all sort of understand is a real part of the role but we sometimes overlook or we just don't necessarily give the importance it needs um, I suppose Antonis last but certainly not least we'll go to yourself yeah, no, I, uh, I echo what's been what's been said. Really, I think maybe three points I would say to sum, summarize. Think practically. If, if jargon isn't your thing, if the the way in which uh, shared decision making gets described nationally isn't your thing, ultimately it all boils down to engagement and conversations. It's about asking people how they want to be involved in their care, and that's that's fine to do. If jargon isn't your thing, just remember it's really just about having a conversation with someone. Um, I think the second thing is that the benefits of, of involving individuals in their care is if both at an individual level and at a service level are definitely there to see. You know, we can really, by adopting the principles of shared decision making, I think make it a, a real important difference to the way in which personalised care gets delivered and rolled out in the, uh, in the UK. And the final thing I'd say is that people want to know and work through their healthcare. They want to understand what the problem is or may be and have uh, an informed way of, of coming to a conclusion with their healthcare team about the best way forward. The worst thing that we can do is make assumptions on behalf of individuals because assumptions can lead us to negative consequences. So I, I would agree with Rachel, just starting a conversation about what, what matters to you is probably the best way of taking forward a, a conversation on shared decision making. Absolutely. And it is sort of, that is what it comes down to. And it's been sort of really 
interesting and really insightful to hear obviously all three of yourselves um have very different roles within health and yet as we keep saying all of the conversations we're having they echo each other because that is what shared decision making is it's about the shared view across the board um i mean i could talk about this for hours and hours but i'm sure our listeners have found everything that's been said so insightful and so important and probably quite um impactful to the way they go about things even just to make people think so um to each of you individually and collectively thank you so much for taking the time to be on uh today's episode it's been a really great conversation thank you very much um and yes certainly to our our listeners hopefully it's been a great episode as well um as we've said we've had rachel power from the patients association david pilbury from pine msk partnership and antonis um, Solomontis from Abvi. Um, I'm sure if you reach out to any of them with more questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to help. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to this episode of NHE's Finger on the Post podcast. Join the conversation on social media or get in touch through the link on our website. To stay up to date with all the latest news and episodes, make sure to subscribe, drop us a rating on whatever streaming service you're using. This has been National Health Executive's Finger on the Post podcast. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.